Hello chess fans. Today I'm excited to show you a new game from Anatoly Karpov. In this game, he's going to be playing Viktor Korchnoi in the year 1978 in their world championship match in the Philippines. Now, Karpov was world champion at the time, but since he hadn't actually had to play a match against Fischer who had forfeited, the legitimacy of his title was, let's say, a little bit shaky. Meanwhile, uh, Korchnoi had only two years previously defected from the Soviet Union. So he was as non grata as a persona can be within Soviet circles, and there was certainly a lot of tension in this match both on and off the board. Previously in the match, all seven games had been drawn. This was the eighth game and was the game in which Karpov kind of broke the deadlock. In this game, we're going to see Karpov demonstrate some of his great attacking play, something we've been exploring on this channel. And what I would encourage you to pay attention to is how Karpov is willing to make simple moves, including all of his pieces, and is willing to make exchanges. The ultimate goal, I think, is really that Karpov achieves a really excellent harmony with all of his pieces and doesn't rush the attack as I think so many players do. Let's dive in. The game opens with e4, e5, knight of 3, knight c6, and a Rui Lopez. It's been said that to really play chess, you have to be able to play the Rui Lopez or the Spanish game well, so suffice to say that I can't really play chess. Now, Korchnoi is going to uh, shake things up a little bit with the open Rui Lopez, which involves this capture here on e4. This is a really exciting and dynamic way to play the Rui Lopez, but it's also considered a little suspect at the highest circles. After the move pawn d4, there's a lot of theory that shows that black really can't get away with capturing this pawn and opening up the e-file. It's just too dangerous. So black is always intending to give back the pawn that has been captured on e4 in return for central control. Here's the establishment of that central control with pawn d5, and here is white getting the pawn back. Now, it's important for black to play bishop e6 here. That's really forced so as to develop and to defend this secure strong point on uh, d5. Karpov plays the most common move. This is kind of a fork in the road. There are some other good choices here, but he chooses to bring his knight out and challenge the knight on e4. That knight on e4 steps back and contemplates the possibility of snatching the bishop pair, uh, taking that away from white c3, and now g6. This move is critical. There are a lot of popular choices here. If I back up a move, bishop e7, pawn d4, bishop g4 are all good moves, and these have all been played and performed fairly well for black. This g6 move is an at-the-board innovation from Korchnoi. It is really dangerous to innovate in a very known position against a player like Karpov. In fact, this move is not very good, and although there will be later mistakes that will cost Korchnoi the game, I would say that this is the most critical mistake that Korchnoi will make. This is very suspect and gets him into hot water very, very early. The idea behind g6 is to play bishop g7 and to attack e5. The problem is black is going to weaken the dark squares directly by playing g6, and capturing on e5, which Korchnoi is going to do, is going to be very, very risky. White is going to get a great attack. Korchnoi is famous for grabbing pawns and for generally being kind of a greedy player. That's not a criticism. It just means that he is more willing than other players to try to take material and weather his opponent's attack when they sacrifice. This leads to a lot of exciting play, and in general, it's an admirable quality. But, as with anything, you can uh, take it too far, and Korchnoi is doing so in this game. Now, Karpov continues with the simple queen e2, bishop g7 from black, and now knight d4, choosing to directly sacrifice the pawn. Now, in this position, Korchnoi's choice is pretty much forced. Having committed to the idea of g6 and pressuring e5, he now needs to capture on e5. If he doesn't, f4, f5 will come, and white will get a great attack without even having sacrificed material. I'll point out one alternative that you might consider. 
black might think about knight takes d4 here. And then c takes, knight takes, knight takes. And after some exchanges, white's attacking possibilities are reduced. The problem is that white need not attack here. White has a tremendous positional advantage because of the control of c5 here. The bishop pair from black means pretty much nothing, and white will soon take the c-file and just dominate all of the key dark squares in this position. So, Korchnoi continues by grabbing on e5, and now Karpov advances the f-pawn. Depending on your chess coach, you might have heard something like f means forward. We should advance and attack with the f-pawn. Or you might have heard f means forget about it. We should never push the f-pawn because it's too weakening to our king. It turns out, as is often the case in chess, that it all depends on circumstance. In this case, f definitely means forward. Black will have no chances to counterattack the white king. And the advance of the f-pawn opens the critical uh, f-file and makes the e-file more sensitive, and we're going to see that translate into a very, very effective attack very quickly. So after f4, the knight must move. It goes to c4, the sturdiest square available. f5, that pawn must be captured before it captures the black bishop on e6. And now knight takes f5. And the g7 bishop is hanging. You might consider castling here. You get to castle and defend the bishop. The problem is that black's porous king side is going to be quickly infiltrated by the white pieces. And in fact, this is a losing position for black. White can start by simply taking the bishop on g7, and after king takes, we can take on c4, the pawn can take, and our bishop comes back to c2. Queen h5, threatening h7, and bishop h6 is a crushing threat. The only way I can see to stop that is queen h4 here. But then bishop e3, attacking c5 and gaining a tempo, and playing bishop d4 next move, is a winning attack for white. I'm not going to explore all the variations. You can if you would like. But basically, black's piece, uh, white pieces are going to get through, and they're going to get through pretty easily in this position. The computer indicates that white has about a five-pawn advantage, which is, suffice to say, huge. Instead, Korchnoi has to leave his king in the center. Instead of castling, he plays rook to g8 in this position. Now, Karpov trades on c4 and then pulls the bishop back to c2. I think that's instructive. A lot of chess players that I've taught would choose to play something sort of hyper-aggressive in this position. They would really go for the throat. And instead, Karpov is going to simply trade on c4, pull his bishop back to c2, and improve the harmony in his chess pieces. When you're attacking, you don't always have the right to force the play. Sometimes you just have to continue furthering your advantage and incorporating more pieces into your attack, waiting for the right opportunity rather than forcing the right opportunity. That's what Karpov does here, I think. So the knight jumps into d3, trying to close down this bishop. And now bishop h6, another nice move and another example of Karpov being willing to exchange some pieces to improve the remaining pieces. Now this final rook is ready to be involved and that will be the only piece left for white to include in the attack. So in this position, why should uh, Korchnoi not take on f7? In fact, he plays the move bishop f8, which obviously looks less appealing. The thing is, after bishop takes h6, knight takes, we're attacking f7. And after, for example, the move rook g6, we can simply take on f7 because the bishop cannot capture due to the pin on the e-file. So this looks lost, right? However, black can play rook g7, advancing the rook and defending the weak point on f7. I think that Korchnoi probably rejected this move because of the very, very scary looking rook takes f7. This move looks like it wins on the spot. The problem is that rook takes f7 allows queen takes e6 check. We'll put that on the board. And this attacking position looks like a winning attacking position. There are a lot of threatening ideas coming forward, like including the final rook, some queen c6 check, for example, if the queen blocks, that could pick up the rook over here, and of course, this is being threatened right away. So it looks like white is just winning, and the computer indicates that this is correct. 
However, if we back up, the rook does not have to be captured. Instead, black can play rook g6. The move that didn't work a moment ago now works because of this double step with the rook, which is very clever. The problem is that it was the knight that wanted to capture on f7 and not the rook. Now that the rook is there, it's suddenly de depending on the knight for its defense. But the knight is not defended, so these pieces are precarious, and in fact, black's position seems to be defendable, which is very surprising. It's a very, very computer-like defense that I would have been surprised for Korchnoi to find. If we back up though, white can maintain a strong attack here by simply including the final attacking piece, which I think is what Karpov would have found and played. So backing up after bishop h6, we've determined that this move would have been a pretty good resource that might have allowed uh, Korchnoi to defend, um, at least better than in the game. Instead, he plays the move bishop f8, Karpov includes his final attacking piece going after this seemingly strong but ultimately weak knight on uh, d3. In a different game where the knight was not so vulnerable, it could be quite effective. Queen d5, and we're going to pick up the knight on d3 and gain a tempo on the queen. The queen moves back to c6, and we're going to trade here on f8, queen b6 check, which doesn't change very much. The king simply steps away, and the king chooses to capture on f8. White now plays queen f3, attacking the rook on a8, which pretty much needs to move now. The correct move here was rook b8. And white's attack here is very, very strong. Probably this is a, de this is a decisive attack, but there is no immediate way to win yet. White will need to continue pressuring the black position. He's in possession of material equality. He has a better pawn structure. His pieces are more active. His king is safer. Everything is going White's way, but the decisive win that you can calculate to a finish still eludes White. He's going to have to find that. Instead, Korchnoi made the losing mistake here. He plays rook to e8, which obviously looks better than rook b8, where the rook is not doing anything. The problem is that the rook is doing something here on e8. What it is doing is suffocating the black king, which no longer has access to this escape square. That's going to allow Karpov a decisive win. He plays knight h6, attacking f7, and after rook g7, this is a good moment for you to pause the video and try to see if you can figure out how Karpov concluded the game. Hopefully you found the very, very nice move, rook d7. One of the prettiest tactics played in a world championship match. The basic point here is that after bishop takes, there's a queen sacrifice, and a beautiful one. Queen takes, rook takes, rook takes is checkmate. And you can see the role here that the rook on e8 played in stopping the king from escaping to e8. So instead, Korchnoi tried after rook d7 to move the rook back to the square that it needed to go to last turn. After rook b8, knight takes f7. Capturing on f7 simply gets mated after being captured. So the bishop now captures the rook. And this is another good moment. If you want to pause your video, you can try to find the last move that Karpov plays in this position. The final move is knight d8 check. All other discoveries allow the rook to participate in the defense of the final rank. But with this move, the rook is cut off, and after the king moves, queen f8 is simply checkmate. Black can resist a little bit by opening up some escape squares by throwing the bishop in the way, but the computer indicates mate in 25. I'm not going to calculate that, but suffice to say that the attack is very quickly decisive, and I think that we can all appreciate the strength of white's attack. Among other things, white will soon pick up this rook on g7 as well as a bishop on f5 through checks. So. Korchnoi had to resign the game, giving Karpov his first win in this world championship match and uh, beginning his run that would ultimately result in him winning his first world championship match despite having been world champion for three years and uh, allowing him to secure the world championship for up to 10 years. Thank you so much for watching this game. If you liked this video, uh, I would thoroughly appreciate it if you would leave a comment in the video. 
or if you would share this with a friend who you think would also like it. Thank you so much and have a great day.